everyone. Welcome back to Dragonfly Engineering. This week is the conclusion of the piston rod fabrication for the Stoker steam engine, collaborating with Keith Rucker. If you haven't seen them, please see episode one and one and a half, where we start machining of the rod and then we remachine this, the face of the rod using a follow rest. In this episode, we're going to do the CNC thread turning and some mill work, as well as finish up the other Morris taper on the other end. Enjoy. So I just remembered that we're not quite ready to pull this rod out of the lathe yet because we do need to cut the other taper on the other end of this piston rod. Uh, the idea of these two tapers is that they have maximum concentricity. So we want to use the same lathe setup to cut the, the corresponding taper on this end. And that's so both of these tapers, you know, they, this taper wedges into the piston and then this taper wedges into the beginning of the crank system and we don't want to have this rod binding up. So what we need to do first is with the cutoff tool, clear out stock here so that this left-handed tool can enter the CNC cut correctly. So to do that, I need to get the cutoff tool loaded and measure the position of this spot relative to the other end of the rod, probably using the DinoLite USB camera to get a visual alignment uh, with the cutoff tool. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so I've set up the DynaLite microscope camera here. This uh, is a USB camera that plugs into the computer. And this is a live view looking down at our cutoff tool. This is a high-speed steel cutoff tool. And the idea here is that we're gonna visually find the location of this tool relative to the part that we turned. So I'm going to come in, find the beginning of our, or the end of our tool radius here. This, this was CNC cut into the part. So I would say that that is lined up pretty good. Okay, so I will set that and then move down and start cutting out stock so we can do the left-handed cut. So according to the drawing, dimension B is 15 and one quarter. So we're moving, but basically the camera is, is looking at the cutoff tool and not the part. So this part is, we're actually moving the, the polished part along, which can't really see it. <laughs> This is a good sign. Okay, 15 and one quarter. All right, it's taking it a while to get there. I've got it on fine. Let's go to course cut. Okay, so we just entered there and we'll see how our cut goes. Oh, it's not too bad. And hopefully we don't catch the <laughs> cutoff tool in a see it snap off in real time here. 195. I think it's it's had enough. <laughs> So I've loaded the left-handed tool into the tool holder and we've got the, the Dino Light microscope checking out the tip of the tool here. You can see it's a nice fresh new tool. That's a 1 64th inch tip. I'm trying a different tip here to see if we can get a different surface finish because I have to make two of these uh, piston rods. All right, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna jog all the way back down to our datum point that we were using to decide where the cutoff tool was gonna be. And that looks Actually, it can go back a little bit. Okay, and then, you know, because the, this tip is going to be cutting uh, this side of the stock on the other end of the shaft, so we're doing the correct tool offset here. All right, so I'm going to set Z again, Z absolute, and then we are going to move the tool all the way down, probably do our own run out measurement. <laughs> is that shit? It's, couple of thousands maybe I should have backed that off but but it's not touching so that's always good now if I move ten thousandths more we should line up with the cut from the cutoff tool actually it's maybe fun to see if how how good the cutoff tool alignment and all these visual alignment stack ups are working so I'm going to check for clearance of anything around the spindle and I'm going to turn on here we go this isn't rehearsed either so <laughs> you'll see how good or bad I am at finding a zero so we're gonna move the tool in, and it should just skim. 
Uh, it looks like I'm taking maybe a thousandth off. Let's, let's back up a little more. Ten and a half thousandths. Taking a little off. Do eleven thousandths. All right, well, uh, yeah, so I was off by a thousandths over the, over the uh, almost two feet. <laughs> what are you going to do? But anyway, but we added extra clearance on the cutoff tool because cutoff tools aren't very accurate. So let's go ahead and stop playing. And I will come in so we can look at our first skim cut. X absolute set. OK, so we've set the position of our tool relative to the program that we're going to write. OK, so I've already written the program. I don't think it's, it's probably worthwhile for me to go through the process of how we wrote it. But uh, the program is this guy. We can look at it. Uh, let's see here. Actually, we'll go to Setup and Toolpath. OK, so here is the program that we're going to run. We're going to enter from close to the chuck. And then the, the tool, actually, we can do steps. The, the tool is going to start doing this this short hogging out, but uh, on the x-axis as opposed to the z-axis. I'm basically doing it this way so that we have a little bit of a safer entry into the part. And if we keep stepping along, you can see how we're going to be doing all this stair stepping and slowly cutting the, the taper in. All right, as usual, it's always a good idea to do a dry run on a new CNC program, especially when the program is so close to the spinning chuck. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zero the x at 50 thousandths positive which uh, I think you can see on the GoPro. So we'll do X, absolute set. And then we will uh, run our program. Let me zoom in on the GoPro a little bit. Probably lower the lighting. Sorry, I'm fussing with some lighting. <laughs> OK. So to run the program, we go to mode, run, start. Are you, oh. Uh, hold on. Probably need to double check the tool. Whenever it says, are you sure? I really need to double check. <laughs> hold on. Okay, so what we're going to do is go to mode, run, start. It said, ah, oh, it likes my tool now. Uh, and then we're going to hit tracking. And now what I'm going to do is move the, I'm going to zoom in a little bit on the GoPro. Now I'm going to turn one of the knobs and we should be moving to our tool reference position. And we know it hit it when it, that green thing says, OK, you're ready to start. So I'm going to turn on the spindle, spindle forward, and then hit go. But we are still in tracking mode. So nothing's going to happen until, oh, and then we can go to show path. So nothing's really going to happen until I start turning this knob. Here we go. And we are going to cut in a little bit. I guess we we're cutting more than a hundred thousands. Okay. So now this is showing our our little stair step that we're doing. Oh, I got to turn the coolant on. I just got a hot chip. <laughs> okay. We'll keep going. And again, this is the test. Oh, I'm moving backwards in the program. So this is to test the CNC operation, even though we are encroaching on the part a little bit. We should be getting further and further out from the finished surface. But it's a pretty small taper. So ideally, you wouldn't do this kind of a roughing, but as I had chuck phobia. <laughs> So you can see our, our, our little mouse bites are getting shorter and shorter as we come out to the end of the taper. And we're still a hundred thousandths off. You kind of see how the tool is rolling around. It's kind of interesting how it's doing that. To enter the cut correctly and then back out of the cut without doing a, uh, a scrape. All right, now we're out of the material, so I can speed this up. And you can watch the lathe kind of just follow along. Looks like it's got a nervous tick. Okay, then we're going to go back and do our finish, our first finish. Oh, it decided to do the finish from the other side. 
See, this is where the uh, tracking is useful. So we're going to enter the, the tool from the flat. So I, I hope this is going to work out. Yeah, it seems to be doing all right. Actually, we're probably going to have a pretty good finish because we're essentially going backwards on the tool. And then this will be the actual finish cut. But we're still a hundred thousands high. And then we go back to zero. Okay, here goes the final run after we did our final tool offset. There is supposed to be a fillet here, as you can see. So let's uh, go ahead and go back into run. All right, here goes. Again, we're gonna be cutting air for most of this. So I'll probably just fast forward until the finish cut. We go back into jog mode. I was getting a little worried about this steel wool trying to uh, re-grind into the cut. I don't think it did. And actually that's a really nice looking finish. Okay, the next step is to turn our stock around in the chuck. And what we're gonna do is turn the threads in the other end of our Stoker steam engine piston rod here. So I'm gonna very carefully, oh, and I've got a, uh, a cut out chunk of a soda can has some soft jaw liners. So if I had a four jaw chuck, I'd be able to dial in the concentricity of the shaft perfectly. Uh, this chuck, and to be honest, I forgot the name of the manufacturer, is a pretty good chuck, but typically you're gonna be off a couple of thousandths on concentricity. So we may actually have to shim individual jaws to bring this guy in and then play around with tightening the, uh, the jaws uh, to bring in our cylinder. Or who knows, maybe we'll be, we'll be lucky enough to hit it on the first shot, but that's extremely unlikely. <laughs> and we'll put the one micron dial indicator back. This would probably drive me crazy, so I think I'm gonna go with the one thousandths indicator. Let me go ahead and hook this up. Uh, it's, it went on this Noga flex stand. Let's see how quickly I can get it back on there. And then we'll bring in our indicator. I'm kind of sticking it out a little far, but the cutting of the threads or the final shaft for the threads doesn't need to be, you know, sub thousands accuracy because it's really just how the nut screws on. The important part is the taper of this, of this, this Morris taper that locks into the piston that uh, I think Keith Rucker is going to remake the piston head. So everything else if the nut is one thousandths out of round, it doesn't really matter because the slop in the threads is a few thousandths anyway. But, you know, we want to get it as good as we can get. And I can demonstrate the kind of the kludge of getting a three jaw to work like a four jaw with shims. I'm going to turn this chuck. Now I haven't really tightened things down. But yeah, right now it's, it's running out about one thousandths total, which which is actually pretty surprising. This is a lottery winning day for this chuck because usually it's out a couple of thousands. But uh, <laughs> I may not have the opportunity to show you my tricks. And the next one will be out. So when I turn the next piston rod, it'll probably will be out. But one thing you can do is you can start adding additional shim between your stock and your jaw. Yeah, because the three jaw, they all three jaws move in at once, and there's a big spiral scroll pattern in here which engages teeth, and that's not super accurate. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll get shim and I'll stick shim in here and then dial it in. But normally it would be fortunate that we don't have to do that, but in this case it's unfortunate because I can't really show you the process. So using the hand wheels, the servo hand wheels on the, the CNC lathe, which is a, for those who are just joining us, it's a track TRL 1630 from Southwest Industries. And it's a CNC lathe, which is, can be used as a manual lathe too. So that's what I'm doing. So I'm turning two wheels for the cross slide and the Z axis. And right now we're just gonna rough out the, the original stock to get down to the one and one eighth diameter for the
turning of the one and one eighth dash seven thread. I'm making a bigger cut here and you can kind of see how it's a little rough on the tool. The chip is getting hot and it's not breaking either. Now you get some pliers to pull out this chip because these will cut you quick. They're basically serrated razor blades, especially with this hard steel. I can do a bigger cut because I'm closer to the chuck and I'm not flexing the part as much. Oh, there I'm getting some better chip control, kind of. In production runs, you want to have your chip be like small bits that shoot off and don't get bird's nest up on your part and mess up your coolant flow or get wound up in your part that you're turning. Again, I'm using pliers to get that out of there. So we're at 1.309 inches. So I will tell the mill or the lathe that this is X 1.309 absolute. We want to go to 1.125 to start, but that diameter will probably be reduced once we do fit checking with the nut that we turned on a previous episode that screws onto the end of this piston rod. So this is the DinoLite camera, USB cable to the computer, and so I'm bringing in the tool. I'm not spinning the chuck or anything, and behind that is the graphics on the soda can that we used. And I'm gonna I'll probably move it a little bit once I get real close. And let me set this Z-axis to fine pitch, because I don't want to chip our tool. And I'm going to bring the tool in slowly while I'm moving the shaft in the chuck to get a zero location. And I'd say that is good for a zero. And then here is the stock and our tool that we just set the new zero for, for the flipped around part. All right, so I got the 3D model of the shaft up here on the computer so we can measure from the edge that we just touched the tool off on visually to the back end of our thread. So this is all, this is reversed to how it's in the chuck right now. And we are looking at 1.299 inches. Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'm just going to manually turn the, sh the stock down to the, to the maximum diameter of the thread. Okay, there we go. I'm just going to turn, skim cut this to get a visual of where zero is that we set. Probably about half an inch of excess stock, but we can just cut threads into all that. Okay, here is our castle nut that we are going to thread on. I just want to make sure I don't do anything stupid at this point. <laughs> okay, so let's go down to 1.125. I'll go back to coarse feed so things will go a little quicker. Okay, point zero. I'll measure this with calipers since it's a, it's a coarse measurement. So this tool here, this carbide insert is my typical thread cutting insert. And the tips there is, is what actually cuts the threads. You can, you can spin it around three times or have three fresh tips to cut threads. And it's a single point thread cutter. Uh, the issue is that this one is too small in diameter, or the, the tips are too small for the thread pitch that we're going to cut. So I'm going to actually go ahead and use this cutting tool, which is not really intended as a thread cutter, but the profile of this triangular insert actually matches the profile of the thread we're going to cut. This came from Enco back when Enco, it's an online machining supply magazine. So it's not a very high quality insert, but it's a fresh tip and it's the correct profile, so we're gonna go with it. And we're gonna load this guy into the tool holder. I've already set the height. You can see here, let me zoom in, that the threads are start to become underdeveloped as we approach this sharp corner here, which, which is this sharp corner in our machine part. So 
what I need to do is anticipate where the CNC thread cutting operation is going to terminate. So I need to back off the actual CNC thread uh, by it looks like maybe 50 thousandths or such that we do not chamfer our our cornered feature with the corner of our of our uh, triangular shaped thread tool. So if we go to mode and then program and then we go to the beginning of our program that we wrote which is just one event thread milling. Anyway, so Z begin I also is set to zero because I did move our tool off from the last position that we found, uh, you know, that sharp corner by 1.7 inches. So yeah, 1.7 inches is the distance we're going to travel. Oh yeah, so Z begin, it starts at zero. X end, again, is the cross slide distance, is the same diameter that we started with. With CNC thread milling, you can make tapered threads and all sorts of variations of threads, but in our case, it's a straight thread. So we're our beginning diameter is one and an eighth inch and our finished diameter is one and an eighth inch. And ZN, like I just mentioned, is minus 1.7 inches in and that will bring us back to that point that I visually set. The pitch is seven threads per inch and this actually threw me off. I actually wrote seven in there and the lathe was gonna try to cut a, a helix that's seven inches long, which didn't work out. So it's not threads per inch, but it's actually the distance of one seventh of your, of of, of our threads, or one over the pitch. So 0.1428. Depth of pass, I'm doing 20 thousandths per pass, uh, just to be safe, because I'm not too familiar with threading this hard steel. Number of spring passes is two, and that's basically just going back over very lightly to, to form up any kind of flexure or other little minor defects in your threads. And plunge angle, 29 and a half. That's the angle that the cutting tool enters into the thread. Uh, so if this was zero, then the, the cutting tip would come straight into the shaft like this. Then you're cutting with both sides of the cutter and you can get more chatter and it doesn't cut as well. So we're actually coming in just slightly less than the 30 degree angle of, of our insert, or which is the angle of the thread, so that we are just cutting on one side of the cutter. Hopefully that made sense. Uh, we're cutting on the, this is an outside thread. Number of starts is one. Uh, some threads, there's actually two overlaid helixes. So if you had two threads, then there'd be two starts on, on the beginning of your thread. And you can go all, go all the way up to four, I think, on this. So in, any, in our case, we're just doing a single point, single turn thread, so there's one start. RPM is 150, which is the lowest RPM. Tool number one is what I just set. So if we go to setup, and tool setup. Tool number one is our tool. Here's a, a little depiction of a thread cutting tool, but in our case, ours is a little different. And I set the tool position. So, let's go ahead and cut a thread. Okay, the airplane flew over. Yeah, my shop is underneath the airport final approach. Oh, and there's the train. <laughs> All right, let's turn on our coolant. I wanna make sure we got good coolant. Because once the thread cutting starts, it's kind of locked in. I don't think you can pause it or, or terminate it. I will have my hand on the emergency stop button though. So there we go with our cut. It looks correct. There we backed out. Let me adjust the coolant a bit. Ooh. Ah, looks like I busted my tool. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> okay, so if you saw how basically the the cutting the thread cutting tool stalled out on the the cut here because it's super strong steel, it started pushing our shaft in to the chuck a little bit. So I need to pull the shaft back out, and then the next thing is. Uh, switch the tool insert around to a fresh cutting tip. Then I need to figure out how to resynchronize the cut to the existing spiral cut in this in this uh, shaft here, which is about one third developed. Oh, and also reduce the cut depth. Wow, yeah, we're actually synced up. So that's good to see. But I'm going to hit stop.
We're either really lucky or the shaft did not move <laughs> uh, radially uh, when we broke off the tool and pushed the part in a little bit. And we'll fix, get rid of this, this snow plow of <laughs> nickel chrome molly steel here. Yeah, this does feel pretty rough. I may actually drop the cut pass from 10,000s down to 5,000s. All right, so I think we're back to a reasonable profile there. Another thing to be concerned with if you ever break off a carbide tool, especially an end mill, is you may have busted off wedged in pieces of carbide in your stock. Then when you come along with a fresh tool, it's just gonna hit that chunk of cardboard, carbide inside of your steel and break off again. All right, let's try this again. Uh, I've also, yeah, so I've had more oil and let's try cutting. And we are four thousandths depth of cut. So let's see what happens here. So we're gonna say mode, run, start. Got my can ready, oil can that is. Turn on the spindle and then hit go to run. We'll see how well we're synchronized. Looks pretty good. Got a ways to go though. Not like there. We're starting to get back into the cut. Okay, we're rolling off a decent thread there. I guess in hindsight, the 20 thousandths uh, depth of cut that I specified results in, would have resulted in a 10 thousandths thick chip. And usually you want your chip to be a couple of thousandths thick. So I may still be pushing it. You get some oil. So that may have been my bad. <laughs> I reduced the RPM down to 150. I think we're on our spring pass now. That's basically just a small cleanup pass. I don't think a spring pass actually removes material. It just cleans up the flexed tool and shaft. All right, we made it. <laughs> Okay, now what we're gonna do is cut a chamfer in this 60 degree tool, just so we can try, start testing our nut and see how our nut fits on. That's, that should be all right. So this lathe actually calculates the depth of cut when you give it a pitch and it assumes the, the 60 degrees for your thread profile. But I'm still 10 thousandths larger on diameter. So this, this nut should start, but then not be able to go very far because we've got like a, a effectively a 10 thousandths interference. So let's see how, yeah, so it's, it's showing that we're starting, but we gotta, we gotta take more uh, clearance slop off of this thing. Well, actually 10 thousandths plus clearance slop. So I'm gonna go ahead and update the, the tool diameter. I'll be right back. All right, here we're starting to cut. Just a little bit, let's hope. <laughs> Oh, those threads are definitely sharpening up.
Okay, let's see what we got. Let me zoom out. I'll try the nut before we wire wheel. Yeah, it's still a little tight. Yeah, got a little more to go. Here we go again. <laughs> Getting low on oil. Get the coolant going. Okay. I think this is the one. Oh, look at that. Nice. And it cinches down at the end. I think there's a little bit of a taper in the nut, but now that feels good. There we go. <laughs> I hope I got that on camera. Yes, I did. All right, so we're over at the Haas TM1 mill. This is a simple CNC mill with a 10 tool tool changer. And the final operation that we're going to do is milling a slot, a tapered slot, uh, so that Keith can hammer in a a tapered wedge when he's assembling the piston rod to the piston in the Stoker steam engine. And then on the other end, we're going to drill a simple 3 16 hole for the cotter pin for the castle nut. So I've already loaded this, this piston rod into two vices and I found the zero. I put the same soda can soft uh, aluminum shim in so that we don't mar the finish when I clamp down on the piston rods and the zero location is in the center of the shaft at the tip here. All right, so I've imported the 3D model of the piston rod into the CAD system here. You can see how we've got the threaded end on down here with our castle nut through hole right there. And then on the other end is the tapered end that goes into the piston with our notch here. And I show some of the tool paths. Let me clear the tool path. Okay, so if we look dead on at our tapered notch, let me get the right view. Well, or I can show you all the different views. Ah, oh, here we go. So if you look down in here, then this, this is the tapered portion of our notch, as you can see. So if we go to the see-through, we got a bunch of military planes flying over now. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so if we look uh, at the line view of our model, then we've got our first step is going to be some pilot holes for our drill. So these are just center drills. The next step is going to be some deep drills. These are slightly less than 3 eighths of an inch drills that we're going to drill all the way through our stock. Let me turn back on so you can see how we're going to drill through the stock to get some pilot holes. Next operation is a horizontal 3D roughing. And you can see here how basically our taper is starting to form. So the end mill basically is just gonna travel down through here. I can animate the operation and basically do a bunch of round pockets to clear out, getting a little less and less on width as we follow the taper. And then the final operation is gonna be a 3D profile, which basically will clean up the and smooth out the surface of our tapered end. And here we can show how that's going to work as well. You can see how the tool is going to basically hop up and down to clear out that guy. I mean, it's not showing all of it, but you can imagine how it goes. Oh, there it goes. It's going to go all the way to the bottom. And I can spend more time making this more precise, but it's not really worth it. A lot of times it's cheaper just to let the mill run than to spend time fussing over details. So that's the idea. So let's go ahead and post out this program to instructions for the mill and then start cutting. So let's go ahead and set the height of this first tool, the 5 16th four fluid end mill. This is all through holes, so the exact height of the tool is not critical and I don't want to mar the finish, so I'm going to do the old copier paper trick where we bring the tool down and I start to wiggle the copier paper 
till we pinch it. And then that tells us that the tool is approximately four thousandths or 100 microns above the surface or the top of the cylinder, which is the zero for our CNC program that I'm going to show you in a second. And I basically start dragging this guy and then it, when it pinches, it tells us that we are on, or we're one paper thickness above the stock, approximately, minus a little bit because we pinched the paper. But for this application, just setting it at 100 microns or 4 thousandths above is okay. So tool offset measure, and then I'm gonna tell it next tool, M6T4. M6 means change the tool to tool number four. And this is our drill bit. It's a couple of sizes smaller than 3 8 which is the nominal diameter of our slot. And we'll do the same trick. And when you start to feel drag on the paper, that tells you that you're on it. So offset, tool number four, tool offset measure, and then next tool. Next tool is our drill center. So bring down our, if you wanted to, if you wanted more accurate heights, then you could offset by the paper thickness minus whatever you think the pinch interference is. Okay, tool offset. I started to feel the paper tighten up there. Okay, so let me go ahead and do the next tool. Okay, so I got the program loaded and the tool height set. So let's go ahead and hit start. Okay, so looking at the new machine part and the old machine part, there's a few differences that, it, that we need to point out and figure out. Maybe I need to talk to Keith Rucker about this. But the original part uh, was machined 100,000 short from the, basically the, the end of the taper here. So if you look at this dimension, we're at looking at a right, right around 400 thousandths, 410, but it's, I'm basically eyeballing the edge of a rusted fillet there. So it's, yeah, it's basically a hundred thousandths off because the drawing calls out one half of an inch. So the new part, which I just machined, I, I did machine this to spec this distance uh, to be 0.5 inches or half an inch. And I'm kind of eyeballing the edge here, but I used the CNC for a more accurate uh, dimension. And so the question is why, why were they a hundred thousandths off on this slot. The length of the slot sh at the top should be one and one eighth inches, and there are 1.125 inches, and they're up, up around 170 thousandths. So definitely like off a bit. <laughs> so I'm wondering if there is a engineering change notice or update on this drawing that happened. There are Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight revisions to this drawing. The last revision was in 1956. But I would assume that this trace, because they also say trace from standard Stoker drawing E1018-C. So the question is, did in the evolution of this part in the Stoker steam engine, did a change happen in the design that didn't actually get reflected into the drawing or did someone just screw this up? But being off a hundred thousandths is pretty major. Um, you can also see that, let's see if we can zoom in on this guy. So you can, you can see on this part that the original witness mark for the mating part, the, the piston head, no actually I think this is the collar. This is the crankshaft collar, the other end of the, of the piston. There's a, a rusted witness mark that shows the area that this wedge fit into or this wedge hole with a tapered wedge pin. And 
you can see how we're definitely offset. Now the whole point of this wedge is to push push the rod deeper into the into the the cup on the connecting rod for the piston or to the crankcase. So effectively what I did is I increased the length of the back of this slot a little bit uh, to, to try to bring us back into spec. Now when I say a little bit, it's like 20 thousandths more, uh, where this is like 100 thousandths off. <laughs> And uh, I did increase, or like I mentioned before, I added about five thousandths to the width of the slot so that Keith could fit his standard 3 8 stock taper pin in there. So there we got, yeah, 3780. So I may have to get Keith on the line or show him this video, and, and he may actually have to test fit on his end the other piston rod and see exactly what's going on with the corresponding coupler that goes to the crankcase. Anyway, so that's where we're at right now. I'll get a couple pictures of this. And just so you know that this is a trial run part, I'm actually gonna turn the final two shafts for Keith with everything I learned on making this shaft. So this is not the finished part, but I don't wanna bore you with basically just running production on the setup that I've, that I've learned through the feeds and speeds and the details. But I do need to ask Keith about this, this one deviation here you can see. Anyway, we'll figure it out, but I'm going to say this is a wrap on this episode. Next week, uh, I've got a day job where I'm going to injection mold a couple of small plastic parts. So we're going to do like a, a start to finish mold design, mold fab, and injection molding of some little, some little clear plastic parts. So it should be fun. So stay tuned for that. All right. Thanks for watching. Talk to you later. Bye.